It's another sunny, beautiful day in ancient Egypt during the illustrious reign of Pharaoh Ramses II. At the bustling dock in Thebes, a boy named Atet is preparing for a great adventure. Wow, I thought today would never come. My brothers and I are heading down the Nile with our dad. My very first trip. Since I'm missing scribe school, teacher says I need to write everything down and give a report when I get back. So mom and dad gave me my very own med head, a set of writing tools for the trip. It's got reed brushes, a palette, and ink. We always use red and black ink in Egypt. I'm not sure why, but it reminds me of our red and black lands. Most of Egypt is like this, hot and dry. It's pretty easy to see why we call it Deshret, the red land. But some of Egypt is like this. It looks green on the top, but underneath is very rich black dirt. We call this land Kemet, the black land. It's where we grow all of our crops. If you flew like a bird, you'd see that the Kemet is all along the banks of the Nile River. Dad says that's why Egypt is called the gift of the Nile. <laughs> Sounds strange, I know, but let me explain. Egypt is mostly desert, right? But look, here, flowing through the whole length of the country, is the Nile River. It starts in the lands far to the south and travels nearly 4,000 miles to the sea up north. Everything in Egypt happens along the Nile. For one thing, it's like our main road, the very best way for anyone to travel around the country. But even more important than how the Nile carries us is what it brings us. Every year, heavy rains far to the south wash a lot of silt, or weathered rock particles, into the river. Dad says the silt combines with leaves and branches to form a rich mix full of iron, zinc, and other things, kind of like vitamins for the soil. We call this good stuff hoppy. So, every summer, all this water and hoppy flow down the Nile into Egypt, flooding the land for four months. When the floodwaters recede, they leave the hoppy behind. It makes the dirt really good for planting. A very long time ago, my ancestors started living along the Nile and planting crops. Then, they had some very smart ideas. First, they dug ditches and canals to trap in the flood water. Then, during the dry season, they would open the canals and let water flow into the fields. Sometimes the fields were higher than the canals, and it was really hard to carry enough water by hand. So, they invented the shadoof, a long pole with a bucket at one end and a weight at the other. It makes lifting heavy water a lot easier. Delivering water to crops is called irrigation. We are some of the first people to figure out how to do that. Pretty clever, huh? We Egyptians are always coming up with solutions to complicated problems. For instance, the Nile's floodwaters are so important that we developed a way to predict when they would arrive. We watch the moon and stars very carefully in order to keep track of the river's rise and fall. Out of that, we created a really accurate calendar with 365 days. The Sumerians only have 360 days in their calendar. Our New Year starts with the first day of the flood when the star Sirius rises directly with the sun. Then we have four months of Ake, the time of flooding. Four months of Purit, the time of sowing, when the river recedes. 
and four months of Shimu, the time of harvest and heat. Everything in Egypt revolves around the seasons of the Nile. But not only did we figure out when the Nile was going to flood, we also figured out how well it would flood. We built a Nileometer to keep track. It measures the water level at all times, letting us know the best height for the incoming floods. If the flood is too low, we don't have enough water for our crops. If the flood is too high, everything washes away. Lucky for us, most years the Nile floods are just right. We can grow all kinds of crops, like barley, wheat, flax, vegetables, and fruits. Dad says we have been farming like this for thousands of years. That makes us very experienced and well organized farmers. If the floods are good, it's easy to grow enough food for everyone. And that frees up time for us to work on other projects, like building cities and temples. We couldn't do any of that if it was hard to grow food and we were hungry. So thanks to the Nile, we have a land of abundance. That's what Dad means when he calls Egypt the gift of the Nile. Speaking of Dad, where is he? I'm ready to start this boat down the river. We're going from Thebes down to Tanis, where Pharaoh Ramses lives, to deliver some important documents. Dad is a scribe, someone who can read and write. Not very many people can do that in Egypt. Scribes write everything down. They keep track of our harvests, arrange our irrigation and building projects, and write letters for people. So it's a very important job. I go to scribe school to learn how to read and write. It takes a lot of practice, but it's really fun. For one thing, we have different kinds of writing. This is hieratic script. We use it for our everyday writing. These are hieroglyphs. They are used for more formal things, like proclamations from the pharaoh and religious matters. It takes years to learn hieroglyphs. There are more than 700 symbols and they combine in lots of different ways to make words. Some hieroglyphs are hard to draw, like this one, the symbol for thought, our god of writing and wisdom. But some hieroglyphs are so easy, even my little brothers could write them, like this, sun, or this, papyrus. Oh yeah, papyrus. Another gift of the Nile, and another great Egyptian invention. Papyrus is a plant that grows along the banks of the Nile. It's really dangerous to harvest, because hippos, crocodiles, and snakes live in the water, which is why these men are singing loudly and beating the water with their oars. But the papyrus plant is important to us. We eat it, use it for boats, burn it for fuel, and even make sandals with it. And we make scrolls out of it. First, we cut the inside of the stalks into strips. Then we lay the strips at right angles to each other, pound them until they stick together, and then glue the sheets together to make scrolls. What a great invention! For the first time in history, we could pick up our writing and carry it with us. We could never do that with one of these obelisks. Papyrus makes it possible for us to write down much more information and save it easily. As Dad always says, information is power, and Papyrus has helped make Egypt very powerful. Papyrus can be fun, too. We even created the first comic strips. Some are over a hundred feet long. But best of all, we write down our stories. Dad knows lots of great Egyptian stories. One of my all-time favorites is the tale of Osiris and Isis.
Long ago, Osiris, the god king, ruled the land of Egypt with his wife, the beautiful and smart Isis. Osiris was a wise and great ruler who brought civilization to Egypt. He taught us how to plant crops and care for animals. He gave us a code of laws to live by and showed us how to worship the gods. It was a beautiful time and everyone was happy except for one person. Set, Osiris's brother. He was really jealous. He wanted Osiris's power for himself. So he tricked Osiris into getting into a coffin. Then he nailed the coffin shut and threw it in the Nile. Osiris's coffin floated down the river to the sea and away from the land of Egypt. Isis was heartbroken. She searched high and low so she could find Osiris's body and make sure he had a proper burial. Meanwhile, Set stole the throne of Egypt, but he was cruel and unkind. There were wars and people were hungry. It was a very dark time. Dad says that Set thought he conquered Osiris's throne forever, but he didn't count on the power of love. Isis never gave up. She finally found Osiris's coffin near a tree far to the north. With magical help from Thoth, the god of wisdom, she brought Osiris back to life. But even the most powerful magic can't bring the dead back to our world. So Osiris became the king of the next world. But that's not the end of the story. Isis and Osiris had a son, Horus. When Horus grew up, he fought Set to win back the throne of Egypt. Horus won the battle and banished Set into the darkness, where he lives to this day. Now Horus rules over us from his god throne and advises our pharaohs. And Osiris rules over the next world. From time to time, Set tries to battle Horus for the throne. That's when we have wars and famine. But Dad says, one day Horus will vanquish Set once and for all. And then we will live in peace and prosperity forever. I can't believe we've been on the river for two weeks already. It's been days since I've written anything for my Egypt report. Well, I have been a little bit distracted. My brothers and I are keeping track of our favorite animals. We've only seen most of them on temple paintings. Now we get to see them up close. Our artists are fantastic at drawing animals. See how carefully they notice everything about the birds? Yesterday we saw an ibis. Remember Thoth, the god of wisdom and writing, from the Osiris story? Well, one of his symbols is an ibis. Animals represent many of our gods. Female hippos represent Tower, the goddess of childbirth. But male hippos can be pretty destructive, trampling fields and stuff. They sometimes represent Set. Remember him from Isis and Osiris? Here's Sobek, the crocodile god. He protects the pharaohs. You definitely don't want to get on Sobek's bad side. Our crocodiles can grow to 30 feet long. And they are not vegetarians. These are vultures. They are very sacred to us. See how they spread their wings? It's as if the vulture is praying or protecting us. That's how vultures became the symbol of the goddess Nekbet, the guardian of children and mothers. And look, the hieroglyph for vulture reads moot, or mother. Mom says she likes vultures fine, but wishes mothers were named after a prettier bird. This morning, we saw a lot of water buffalo. Dad says they are a symbol of King Narmer, the first pharaoh of Egypt. A long, long, long time ago, about 3,000 years before my time, 
the Nile Valley just had a bunch of little farming villages. Eventually, the villages formed two kingdoms, Upper and Lower Egypt. Wait, let me explain something first. Remember how the Nile River flows from south to north into the sea? That means upstream is south, at the bottom of the map, and downstream is north, at the top. Which means Upper Egypt is south, near Thebes, and Lower Egypt is north, near the sea. Okay, where was I? Right, King Narmer. When King Narmer came along, he unified all of Upper and Lower Egypt. He was a powerful ruler who got people working together. He set up a system for irrigating our fields, and he established a code of laws for everyone. He was our first pharaoh, a god here on Earth, sent to rule the Egyptian people. What a job Narmer had. I wonder what he would say if he could see his country today. I bet he would be proud. Dad says that tomorrow we're going to see something really old and really amazing. I can hardly wait. And whatever it is, I promise to write all about it the first chance I get. <laughs>